to keep track of my time. Well, I'm going to speak standing. I think this is a teacher's addiction. <laughs> I move around a lot. Um, my name is Rafael. I'm from Universidade Federal de São João do Rei, Brazil. It's a small city in the countryside of Brazil. And I'm talking about de deconstructing micro-utopias. Uh, I'd like to take us back to the concept of utopia that comes from Thomas Moore. He is a British guy from the 16th century. And he's mostly talking about an island, a closed island, uh, where most of the systems are based on economy, economy and control. So um, I'm not so sure that this is a good concept for us to use, but I'm going to start from it. Um, and I like the citation that both good and evil flows from the prince over a whole nation. So you concentrate the power in one person or one entity, it's very like, likely that things will go wrong. <laughs> um, and I want to talk as much as a theoretical framework, but I wanted to reflect some, somehow in everyday practice. And when you start thinking about utopia, you can think about the utopia, the, the, the you meaning no place, so it's the de deterritorialized, uh, or the good place, but the thing is, the good place cannot be attained. Uh, it's very distant from us. Uh, this is why Thomas More made Utopian Island, so it can be reached by the outsiders. And it's a concept that's uh, based on the idea of time. I know Utopia is timeless, it's supposed to go on forever, but this is one of the main aspects of it. And the thing is, time is the dominant aspect of our uh, current thoughts. We're, we think based on time, based on history. And I wanted to show how Messi, uh, Doreen Messi, feels about that. She's a geographer. Um, and the thing about time is it has a directional flow. It goes from the beginning to end. Uh, it must build a consistent narrative. Those of you who are historians know about that. You have to tell a story when you're talking in uh, temporal uh, constructs. It's very resistant to change. And the thing is, utopia is like the end game. If you have a beginning, utopia is supposed to be the end of time, when you reach the perfect society and you have, don't have to change anymore. So change is abolished from that. And Dorian Massey brings the concept of a spatial society as opposed to a, t a temporal society. And she defines a space as something that is defined by the relations, and it's not as absolute as time. And so it's a place of multiplicity and heter heterogeneity, so many things can happen at once, and the simultaneity of things is something very important in space. So uh, it's a place of diversity. Time, while time is a place of consistency, space is a place of diversity. And it's always successful. And I'd like to take you to another theorist uh, from another. I know you have seen a lot of the fact and Harvey here. I'm going to take you to another framework. Flusser is a, a theorist of uh, communication and design. And he likes to define objects, and I love his definition of, of objects. Objects are things that are in our way. So they are, uh, objects are obstacles that we have to surpass somehow. And we uh, create, use objects to help us remove these objects that we find. And in creating that, we create obstacles to remove other obstacles. <laughs> so we keep going on this circle. And the thing is, Every object we create is embedded with intentions limits, which he calls program. So we program objects, we inform objects, we put ideas, thoughts, and ways of doing things into objects. And he separates two special types of objects, which are tools, which are objects of production, the objects that we use to change things and make us, they work for us or have some economic value. 
And the apparatus, which is a playful object, is an object of exploration. It's not about an object of uh, uh, production object. And what I would like to argue is that plants are objects as well. They are things that we build, uh, they are objects of design, and we embed them with our models and our theories, and we want uh, uh, to make them work in a sense that works for us. And that's what I call the microtopias. The microtopias are these ideas that inspire plants, and they are usually very, very personal, even though sometimes they can be uh, shared by many people, but it usually excludes someone out of that. It's very in, uh, difficult to have consensual uh, consent uh, about what a utopia might, be, might look like. And I want to, so this is our some of the planning models that we see. Uh, this is a Sao Paulo model. If you know Sao Paulo, you know that it looks nothing like the city itself. So it's a very idealized version that helps us to think about it, but it's very different from the actual reality of the city. Okay, I think it's working better. Uh, and the thing is, when you have this thing where you put your idea into the city, which is a collectiveness of people, you're very likely to get a side effect because some people will be, will be left out of it. And that's where dystopia comes from. Dystopia, dystopia is a perversion of utopia, where, and actually they are the same. Because someone's utopia might be other, per, other people, dystopia. Because utopia is usually based on uh, harmony, but this harmony has to be enforced. Everybody has to comply to the system. And if you don't, you're very likely to feel that you're in dystopia. And I brought those examples, uh, uh, like the movie in 1984, where you had the Big Brother, which now a pro, uh, TV program <laughs> is very famous, where you're getting observed all the time, where all your actions are being uh, 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 shared with everyone, and you have to think about what you're doing all the time, you have to conform to the standards. And another one that's very interesting is the Truman Show, where you have this true man, the, the, the uh, true character there inside a fake city, and the city that was used for this, uh, as a setting for this movie, is actually uh, uh, the city, uh, the first city that was built using new urbanist principles. So I think this is very uh, uh, interesting to think that new urbanism is producing this kind of cities because it's a very current uh, ideology for producing cities. And what I want to say is that even in modernism, we wanted to um, reduce dissent, actually extinct dissent. We made this common man, the standard man, the model or of Le Corbusier, they're supposed to represent every one of us, and I dare any one of us to stand against a wall where you have the, the model or draw, and to have the same measures as this entity that is there. It's like a French, white, male guy that's in a very uh, uh, forced position that we are never at. So he, we use this to produce all, our, all of our sector from the sixes up. And the thing is, by trying to extreme dissent, to make consent, which is the main aspect of utopia, we start to uh, hide all inher inherent conflict that we have in our society. And I don't think that it's a good idea, because then you have to impose some things to some people. Uh, imposition is a necessity of that. And that is the destruction of public space. The public space is a space of dissent, is where conflict happens, is where I meet with the other, and the other in which the other is not me, I'm going to have to negotiate with it, or I'm going to have to fight with, with, with him. Uh, there is no, I, I don't have that many choices, because there are some, some things that is uh, similar, we share, we cooperate, I don't think that is impossible, but there are some things that we are different. And then I come to this interesting Foucault concept that is the heterotopia, heterotopia which actually is a, 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 a residual space. He says that heterotopia exists in the non-planned space, 
which is very interesting. interesting. And we talked about participation. And I want to discuss this. Uh, Marcel Lopes de Souza is a Brazilian geographer, and he talks a lot on the concept of autonomy, which is a people being critically involved in decisions that uh, are concerned themselves. This requires for us to work with uh, alterity and much with virtuality in the concept that Pierre Levy brings it to us, like, like potential. I, I don't define everything. I leave it open for people to bring their own experiences to it. And this applies not only to the plan planning process, but as well when I use the space. And this becomes a re-educational process. I have to make things pe uh, people think differently about space. And what I'm going to show to you is what we do with our first year students. I have very few examples, so I, I hope I can get through them if you have five years. Uh, and the idea is that they experiment and they experience space and objects in a way that's propositive, so they're always putting some of themselves out in the world, but it's open enough for people to put some things in their structure as well. And it's always open, indeterminate, and participative. Uh, these are some of the objects that they made. They take the invisible series of Italo Calvino, mm -hmm. and they had to make these collages of this series. And some things very open and weird come out of that. And these are the interactive objects that I made with them. It's something that is structural. It has to have limits. But it has to be open for people to interact with it in ways that they can't always predict. This is one of them. I'll show two now. If you have time, I'll show more. These are like antennas with elastics. This other one is with syringes. They're filled with water. So when you press one side of the object, it transmits the topography to the other side, but it's not the same topography. The, the, the relation is obscure. So you don't know exactly what's going to happen when you go to the other side. And here you have only one student using, but if you have two people using this kind of device of communication. And we go, one day of the semester, we go to the public space in the city. It's a very small town, 8,000 inhabitants. Well, a small town in Brazil, I think for Europe it's not that small at all, <laughs> but uh, they have to change the public space and the perception of public space for one day. And they take five weeks to build this. It stands there for six hours and then they have to dismantle it. It's a very quick process. And this one is uh, uh, made of PET uh, bottles with a bit of color and water in it. It's supposed to filter the sunlight. We have, we have very hot climate in Brazil. Uh, this one, they made models of people's bodies using duct tape. And then they cut it out and build it again. Put some water, some light in it. And this one is a model of a Fiat 147 model that was parking above <laughs> the public space, like <laughs> uh, strong criticism about the use of cars in the city. I don't want to narrow it to that, but it, it's one of the probable, probable um, explanations. This is the reference, so I have a bit more examples, so I'm going to <laughs> go straight to that. I think they are more, much more interesting. I think the theoretical part you can see in the paper itself when you get to read it. So I think this is not there, so it's more interesting. Uh, this one, they have this uh, water fountain that is sitting there. And when students were researching about the area, they found out that this water fountain was not uh, the actual water fountain from the 17th century. It was destroyed. It was in another square. It was destroyed, and they built a copy in this one. And they were so outraged about that, they decided to hide it. So they took a picture of the wall behind it. They built a scaffold structure. They uh, enlarged the, the photos, and they uh, covered the, the fountain with that. And behind it, they put the construction noises. <laughs> so it looks like people were destroying it. One of our, our uh, college teachers there was very, oh no, what are they doing in the fountain? 
we sometimes build urban furniture, we sometimes bring uh, furniture or pieces of the, building by the private building environment to the public space, and they always change the, the, the way that you think about them, like <coughs> doors closing a square, and it's not closed at all because you can go around them, but uh, seeing them there makes you think about, well, are we privatizing a uh, public space? And you have this very framed reference when you can see to the peephole of the, of the doors. And here, just another two interactive objects, I think. Well, 30 seconds, I will just give you a sneak peek of it. That's just a uh, folding paper. And as it expands, you can mold it as you like it. And it starts very small, but it can grow really, really big and occupies a lot of space. And this other one, they, can, they did this weird device that you wear. And there is this uh, keyboard that you can manipulate. And what you see, you see this infinite uh, tunnel of light that you can change the light as you were going. So you were moving through space and you have, your senses are kind of uh, thrown out from your movements. So. I think that's it, guys. Mm -hmm. uh, the last show, guys. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. No more clear. uncharismatic after that beautiful stand. <laughs> I'm going to be both reading and sitting. <laughs> um, I wanted to start my presentation with this map here because I think this actually might be a utopia. And I'm not sure if any of you have seen this before, um, but this is Australia prior to British invasion. So what you're looking at here is over 60, um, well, we actually now think it might be um, 80,000 years of continuous culture. Um, on the continent of Australia, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. And the little colours that you're seeing are the divisions between over 200 language and cultural groups, many of which, of course, in just over 250 years have been completely wiped out. Um, so the project that I'm going to be talking about today uh, is located down south, and it's on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And so before I begin, I'd like to pay my respects their elders, past and present, and to acknowledge that their sovereignty was never ceded. Is it working? Oh, there it is. Okay. The project that I'm going to talk to you about is called Section 32. It's one of three projects I've developed as part of a practice-led research PhD, which turned out are not that common in Europe, but are very common in Australia and New Zealand. Um, each of the projects, so my PhD is actually in the School of Art. Um, each of the projects focuses on a different Australian community to interrogate the impact of mobility systems on the social and spatial makeup of that community. The project um, begins with an artist, um, an artist residency, which is just a really fancy term for field work, and then concludes in a site-specific artwork made from the experience of living in that community. Um, the artwork is then presented for free to local communities as a way of encouraging a local dialogue about the past, present and future and the types of urban environments we want to live in. I'm going to start this talk by discussing the community that I developed Section 32 for and what the artwork looked like. I'll then very quickly conclude my discussion by talking about what the artwork taught us about that community that we didn't already know. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Claire and I'm a futurist anthropologist. The house behind me, known as Section 32, appeared on this ordinary suburban block approximately 12 months ago. How and why the house has landed here remains a mystery. However, our research has revealed something absolutely remarkable. The house exists both here in 2017 and simultaneously in a year around the end of this century. 
We have conducted significant testing on the site and believe it is safe. However, we must warn you that the long-term effects of spending time in the future are, of course, undocumented. This is the speech that welcomed 500 audience members that visited Section 32 in groups, uh, um, in groups of 10 throughout its exhibition. So, despite Australia's vast scale and <laughs> international image as a country of hardened outback folk avoiding a deadly array of venomous creatures and vicious animals, Australia is in fact one of the most urbanised countries in the world. 94% of our population resides in a series of cities that cling predominantly to our east coast. Our urbanisation is defined by suburbia, and our cities sprawl even more successfully than most North American metropolises. Melbourne, for example, hosts only 4.5 million people um, to Paris is 9 million, but we consume double the urban footprint. Founded in 1835, Melbourne's population growth has occurred in a series of big booms related to migration and resources. The most significant of these booms include the 1850 gold rush, the post-Second World War migration program from across, across Europe, and our current boom. Australia is currently um, the fastest growing country in the OECD, due largely to a significant skilled migration program. Due to this boom, um, boom it's estimated that Melbourne will expand from 4.5 million to 10 million over the next 30 years, usurping Sydney and becoming the largest city in Australia. Of course, while this kind of increase is nothing like our near neighbours, Indonesia, Cambodia, China and Vietnam, to name a few, it has still represented significant growing pains and an ongoing and necessary evaluation of the types of homes we build. Can the great Australian dream really continue to be a standalone house on a large block of land with a big backyard um, when our city reaches 10 million? In 2006, in collaboration with Knox City Council, so Australia has three tiers of government, federal, state, and then your municipal government, um, so I'm working with the municipal government, I was given a house in the suburb of Baronia to live in and then produce a work for. Located 40 kilometres from the CBD, Baronia is on the eastern fringe of Melbourne. Established in the 70s, the suburb was converted from orchards into quarter acre suburban blocks throughout the 1970s and 80s. However, as our city again enters an era of rapid growth, it is once again being cannibalised by developers, transformed from a suburb defined by the standalone house to a mixed suburb of medium density units and townhouses, apartment blocks and standalone homes. The most common Australian narrative is growing up in suburbia. However, interestingly, I grew up in a remote property in the country, so this move to suburbia rep represents the first time I'd experienced the Australian suburbs. However, importantly, the residency also involved a daily commute to and from my job in the central business district of around 50 minutes each way. 76% of Melbournians currently commute to work by a car, um, taking on average of one hour to get to their work and home again. Post Second World War uh, suburbs such as Baronia, due to their low density, very average public transport and distance from people's jobs, are Fordist suburbs. They're only made possible through the introduction, uh, mass introduction of the automobile post the Second World War. As a consequence, my residency um, gave me the opportunity to see how, 40 years after the suburb's creation, the car was con continuing to shape it, but also to get an insight into how new mobile technologies, such as the internet, smartphones and drones, are impacting and shifting the social and spatial dynamics of suburbia. Um, there I am, commuting. Um, halfway through the residency, I brought on a uh, team of collaborators. Uh, so here we are in our costumes. Um, you've got a sound designer, Robert Jordan, um, and Brianna McNish, who's the director. We would also eventually be joined by a group of actors to execute the work. Um, we, we to, uh, so I'd been living in the house and experiencing it. I'd been reading quite a detailed diary that, of course, also reading the history of Australian planning. So to collaborate with these guys, we covered our house with large sheets of butcher's paper and I started to tra transcribe that, that um, information so we could develop a plan of exactly what the experience of this work was going to be like. So let's go back to where the talk began, the front steps of Section 32 home to discuss what audiences experienced on the inside. Section 32 used a science fiction narrative to build an image of the future. However, like any good sci-fi, its real focus was an analysis of the present. 
From the moment the door swung open, um, the suburban home began to speak. Welcome home, unrecognised occupant, the house announced in its friendly um, female voice, smoother than today's artificial intelligence like Suri, but still a little insincere in its overly friendly and matter-of-fact tone. Remember to keep your carbon in check. Check your carbon meters regularly, it concluded. Moving from the door to the hall, the space was filled with the flashing orange light of three beacons, all rotating at different speeds. The beacons sat on top of a series of different electrical displays, each of which had a name, date of birth, and a serial number etched into it. In our imaginary world, these meters were counting each of the occupants' lifetime and daily carbon uses. This usage was also regulated by the house, which would check in the, and to the meters and chat to the occupants about their activities. This intrusion of technology, the way it monitored the private lives of the house's um, residents, had come from one of the major themes I'd identified during the residency and passed on through the butcher's paper. Google satellite view, drones, household appliances with IP addresses and smartphones have all eroded and perforated the fences and brick facades of the um, suburbia so that the personal lives of residents are on show. They have begun to destroy the artifice of the front lawn and the ability to restrict what was seen by the neighbourhood. After the carbon meters, Robert's sound design became apparent throughout the central part of the house. You could hear loud rolling thunder and heavy rain. This sound design was matched by the real presence of water dripping through the ceiling into buckets in the lounge room or green room, while in the purple room, one of the bedrooms, the floor had given way and a rising sea was coming up through the floorboards. Despite the crumpling architecture, the residents of the house had found a way to embrace um, this new murky and wadi room, sitting around the incoming sea on a cushion, reading sci-fi. The dialogue of the house also occasionally added to the tension, warning the residents of extreme weather outside and letting them know that their fortnightly drone delivery of groceries had been indefinitely delayed due to bad weather. Despite the leaking ceiling, the rising water and the breaking down of the supply chain, the residents remained calm, just managing to keep the weather at bay, applying little bits of tape to the leaking ceiling only for another one to open up. They emptied the buckets of water from the lounge room into a well in the kitchen and sampled the water to make sure it was safe to drink. The sense of the outside world coming in, barraging the occupants of the house, also developed from the residency and my butchers paper discussion with my collaborators. Living in the suburbs, I'd observed that Australian contemporary suburban homes work less as fortresses and more as filtration systems, continuously letting the outside world in. Terribly lightweight architecture lets the sound and light show of the outside world, predominantly cars, filter through, while news of the world infiltrates through computers, smartphones, radio and television sets. There is no longer a clear division between the city and the internal domestic world of the suburban home. However, this, work had also developed, this aspect of the work had also developed from Baronia's position on the urban fringe. Pinned up against the Dandenong Ranges National Park, Boronia is where the city meets climate change at full force. Future bushfire projections for suburbs so close to dense bushland forecast that in the next 50 years those areas will experience a catastrophic fire event every 20 years rather than the current 100 years. In 2009, after a 10 year drought, Melbourne experienced its most deadly fires. 173 people died over a 24 hour period as flames licked the edge of the suburbs. Those fires stopped within 10 kilometres of Baronia, something that residents still anxiously reflect on. In the pink room experienced halfway through the work, dancer Ernesto Munoz, adorned with a pair of goggles, moved about. Sometimes with this, he was performing an abstract form of martial arts, sometimes in a half-responsive stupor. Laid out on the floor as if he had been there for hours, only his index finger twitching. Ernesto was intoxicated by virtual reality, lost in a world outside the one we had entered. For our demobilised and trapped residents surrounded by extreme weather events, VR seemed to be a, a moment of relief, a chance to be mobile virtually, if not in reality. Robert's composition for this room was reminiscent of computer games, the menu section of a DVD or a telephone hall music. The delicate music composition looped continuously and seamlessly, as if Ernesto and the world he had created were in a continuous holding pattern. The VR room was created as a way of exploring the immobility of living in the outer suburbs in Australia. While living in the house had helped me identify a number of ways that technologies of mobility afford visions into the suburban house and link us to the outside world, the daily commute that I did between work and home quickly highlighted the potential for immobility. 
Ernesto was not just trapped in VR, but trapped in his suburban home, a theme that was developed further by other performers who discussed how infrequently they had travelled across Melbourne and how much they'd like to travel to Queensland to see where bananas come from. In 2006, Griffiths University researchers Jago Dugson and Neil Snipe developed the Vampire Index. Um, the Vampire Index methodology ranks suburbs according to their car dependency, car ownership, medium income and level of home ownership, concluding that suburbs on the edges of the cities like Melbourne with high car ownership and dependency due to a lack of density and public transport are particularly vulnerable to um, the impact of rising oil prices and interest rates. The Vampire Index has become a popular dis discussion point amongst urban theorists, planners and local governments because it reverses the way in which we normally assess the economic um, health and well-being of suburbs in Australia. Suburbs with high car ha and house ownership were in the past considered to be amongst the most economically robust. When you put the address of my Baronia house into the Vampire India X, it's code red, rated 10, the most vulnerable to oil increases. I'm going to stop the description of the work here um, because I only have a couple of minutes left. Um, so, uh, so if you're interested in seeing more of this, you can see it on my website and my Vimeo page. It's just Claire McCracken at Vimeo. Um, so to conclude my paper, I want to briefly discuss the outcomes from this work. So prior to Section 32, Knox City Council had no strategic plan in place for the growth of the start of the suburb. Thus, no planning leverage to make um, sure developers constructed anything for the community um, beyond the house they were constructing. They had tried a series of participatory planning events and town hall style feedback sessions, as well as online surveys, but, in but it had been frustrated by how these events had been hijacked by a vocal few who objected to everything and really wanted to preserve this suburb is, is exactly as it had been. They were also frustrated by the lack of diversity of participants at these events. Retirees were overrepresented, while the voice of people with a disability, young people, young families, in other words, those that were going to live in the community the longest, were totally unrepresented. By painting the whole house black, including the windows, Section 32 gained immediate and widespread local and national press. It consequently attracted audience members, particularly from the local areas, in very large numbers, from diverse backgrounds. This was, of course, also aided by the fact that tickets were free. <laughs> After experiencing the work, audience members were encouraged to discuss the work in their community with a group of researchers waiting outside. The outcomes of these discussions, perhaps because they came after a somewhat magical, dystopian experience encouraging a dialogue about the future, were surprising in many ways. They demonstrated that despite a very vo vocal few, most people were unconcerned by their rapidly changing city. Um, most residents acknowledged that the city was getting bigger and that we had to fit people somewhere, and this current boom was in the context of many booms that Melbourne had experienced. They were excited about the diverse housing stock as it meant they could downsize and retire in their community and that there was affordable housing suddenly, finally, available for their children. There was also a lot of discussion about the need to preserve the trees and bushland, despite the bushfire threat, and to move away from backyards to more com community facilities such as shared parklands, play equipment and community gardens. And finally, despite a federal government that has climate deniers in its ranks, and uh, here we have the Deputy uh, Prime Minister of Australia, he's actually just lost his job, which is fantastic, <laughs> holding, on to, <laughs> holding on to a piece of coal like it's going to solve every problem in the world. Um, we, 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 um, so the fact that people were willing to acknowledge that climate change existed and was a thing, I found quite exceptional in this kind of milieu. Um, so in conclusion, by creating an artwork directly from the experience of living in the suburb that reflected on the way mobility systems shape our lives, and by using the fabric of the city itself as a material to construct this work, we were able to cut through, cut through the often hostile debate that occurs in communities undergoing rapid transformation to have constructive, conversation about the current nature of their community and its future. My research findings were published as an autoethnographic diary, which you see here, and I've also got some copies if you wanted to have a closer look, um, which discussed the making of the work as well as the discussions I had with local residents, which is now being used to inform local government planning objectives for the suburb. While local government's ability to enact these recommendations 
and build a sustainable community for all residents remains to be seen. Um, this document also resides in hard copy in the municipal library and as an online resource as a way of hopefully holding that process accountable. Planning departments, RCP thinks about 90 to 95 percent 
of their angle, anything to do with unfortunately. Uh, I want to speak to a little bit of examples of kinds of problems that we can have. This is um, one of my favorite ones. This is um, a map. Uh, it's a utopian vision, uh, again, that has a centerpiece. It looks almost like a character of, of what a city could look like. It doesn't look very realistic, does it? I mean, it's actually been, it's actually someone been going to build a city like that, or yes, they will. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Without the Renaissance, uh, the Renaissance fortress is no longer there. You can kind of see the outline, but the, the, the thing is, people will uh, do that. This is, the, this is the most radical example that I know of of a drawing that actually came to become a reality in quite, a, quite an interesting way. In terms of design, it's very interesting. In this case, I don't really have uh, much against it, if you will, but it does, you know, it does, it does go to show how sometimes we can. Um, we want to project our wishes onto the territory. This is a very, very good example. So Capital City of the Sun is an example of utopian urbanism. If you see, it's almost uh, the, the center the central building uh, is almost a representation of the sun. You know, when I look at this, I think of uh, you know the you know, the, 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 the sun, the sun king, which uh, projects his uh, wonderful rays of beneficence and love for his people onto the rest of the city. Um, another example, very very centralized, uh, a radio centric. Uh, depiction of what a city can and, and look like. These different conceptions of the, of the ideal city are interesting because they do have a radio-centric nature, but at least here you see already a concept of polycentrism coming into being, but again, we do tend to see these radio-centric uh, designs coming back and back and back again, and so they tend to form the majority of how we see utopian cities. This is a very well-known uh, survey of uh, how is radio-centric people to regard the city of tomorrow. There's actually, I will mention an example of someone who's trying to uh, who, who plagiarizes uh, really quite horribly, and, and I'll show you in a little bit. So this is another um, modern utopia, which continue, continues to, to follow the radio-centric design. This is actually, um, you know, quite interesting. There are cities which follow, if anyone knows Paris, it's the exact opposite of this. Paris is, is uh, a center where it's very lowly built, and in the, so this is a representation of the anti-Paris, you know? If you go to Paris, they built, uh, they have very uh, particular height restrictions. So if you go to the middle of Paris, you see six, seven-story buildings at most. And the most dense building happens to be in the periphery. So we have a kind of paradox where the places where people tend to least want to live in are the ones where you can more easily live in because of that. It's very interesting. But here, I can understand where they're, where they're trying to go with it. This is one of my favorite examples, too. I love this so much. This is wonderful. This is, um, I don't know if anyone knows the, um, the Venus Project. There was an alternative media uh, video which gained traction amongst, I think it was called 100,000, it had millions of views, which was called the Zeitgeist, Zeitgeist uh, movie, and it went into like conspiracy theory, and then they formed an alliance with something called the Venus Project, and I love the Venus Project, because whenever I go into places like the Faculty of Architecture, and I, I mention things like this, they always have these oh, these guys are absolutely, you know, these are crazy people, they have no influence whatsoever, but what's funny is, these alternative media outlets happen to have a reach that is actually much higher than most academics, and this is a utopian vision of what a city would look like according to the Venus Project, and I'm not lying. That central building, according to their conception, will be a centralized computer that will control and verify everybody's economic actions to make sure they're viable, and it is, and they call it a utopia. I, I, I'll leave it at that, you know, I'll, I'll leave it at that. This is another really good example. I don't know if you know uh, the Burning Man Festival. Mm -hmm. It actually started, uh, the Burning Man Festival started so the, the, the legend goes, <coughs> the friends on the beach burning a statue. I think it's a, it's a British, it's like a British saving type of a wicker man, if I'm not mistaken, where they used to burn a kind of effigy. I think at one point they actually used to burn an uh, actual life person back in the day. Either way, uh, so it goes that some friends uh, from America had a party on the beach and they burned an effigy. And it eventually developed into what we know today as the Burning Man, which is absolutely huge. And in the beginning, the Burning Man Festival actually had a very good team Okay, but now they developed it again, th this radio center design, and at the center obviously is the Burning Man, which which uh, which they then burn. It's, it's a, I love this example because the Burning Man started something very small, and it has now become it's known now for becoming I think becoming the playground for uh, probably the most potent embryonic oligarchical force we have today, which are the Silicon Valley technocrats. Uh, and so I love this. I love this as a representation of something which started as territorially democratic and huge to go on something which is incredibly hierarchical, radio-centric, just like the Renaissance uh, visions of the city we, we used to have. And they're also really interesting. 
because it does have a kind of circular aspect to it, but at least, at least the main little twist is we're not gonna make it into actual circles, okay? We're gonna make it into sort of vortex. So I, 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 I do appreciate the, the slight touch of originality. Another quite interesting example of greater central planning is the city of Mecca, okay? The city of Kaaba. If you ever see a Muslim praying anywhere in the world, you see them line up in a straight line because they're praying towards Mecca. But when they're actually in the Haram, when they're actually in Mecca, they actually make a circle, right? Because they pray towards one spot, the closer they get, they pray, they pray around a circle. And this is um, the ritual uh, where they um, circle the Kaaba seven times. But this is them moving around. When they stop to pray, you'll see them praying in a circle, all going towards the uh, Kaaba. By the way, the Kaaba is an arbitrarily <coughs> chosen, we call it the Qibla, it's an arbitrarily chosen point that was chosen at a certain point for political reasons to be the place towards which Muslims pray. Many people don't know this, many Muslims don't know this. In the beginning, the primordial uh, Muslim community did not pay towards Mecca, they pay towards Jerusalem. This is something that a lot of, a lot of people know. So this it, it was changed at around the time when the Muslims were exiled in, in Medina. And so as a, people interpret this as a, as a display of intent, let's say. They, they changed their Qibla, their place towards to which uh, they pray to uh, Mecca, and they went on to conquer. This is um, a famous work that was done, which was a manipulation of transportation systems, and an attempt to show how we can actually um, make them, also just for the radio-centric disposition, really quite easy. So this is the London Underground. Um, I've had to quiz the New York subway to notice. I've had to, I've had to turn it 90 degrees to fill up the page. But it's really, really quite easy to, uh, to change these systems so that they also got a radiocentric outline, the Paris Metro, even more so. I'm going to have to start a little bit more quick. So, um, going into the Ukulele Day, we've already spoken of the, the, the kind of utopian visions, but perhaps what's most important about the Ukulele Day is it has very strict zoning. And the reason why I'm speaking of this, I'm going to skip through this, because I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run out of time. And this is where I come to really my favorite examples of utopian visions, which are actually taken from this thing. Uh, there are cases when I see cities in the West Coast built almost as character, caricatures of themselves, right? So when people sit around and people say, what does, it, what does a city look like? What should it look like? And then they actually sometimes, unfortunately, manage to make their dream come true. As you'll see, one, one such example is, uh, is the city of Lisbon. Uh, to a degree, we did manage. Um, I'm going to skip this if you guys don't mind. Uh, and I think I'm, I'll be running out of time, and I do want to spend a little bit of time uh, with, the, with, the Lisbon, uh, with the Lisbon case study. Uh, Lisbon's my city, where I live. A lot of what I do is, is studying what is happening in Lisbon. And what's, what's striking about Lisbon is that when people come to Lisbon, they don't really get a full view, especially today, of what Lisbon actually is for most of Lisbon's inhabitants. You could say that about a large part of, of inhabitants all over the world, but what's really striking about Lisbon is how when you go to Moreria, when you go to Alfama, and you go to these uh, wonderful, uh, which has now become places of attraction, you see the kind of urban design that's implemented. They're actually very, very strict lines which separate the center, the center of the city, which is uh, very, um, I guess, very uh, classical, from the second periphery and the third periphery, which nobody who visits Lisbon ever goes to. Uh, and as we'll see, this was actually. This was actually uh, implemented by the municipality uh, in the 60s, as we'll see. So I'm skipping through the slide because I really want to get to one particular one. So this is the Lisbon's first plan of urbanization, 1935. What you can see here is this is just a kind of color coding which doesn't really doesn't really reflect what the city became. But what you can see here already is a much more minute and detailed attempt to plan the center of the city as opposed to the periphery. So when, what this what this I mean I can go. I, I, <coughs> hours about this, but what it does show is that as, in, in my view, because we are cut off by a huge river, when I speak about the center of Lisbon, there are also little central hubs which spread across the coast for obvious reasons, right? A lot of people want to live on the coast, so if you if you start going west, eventually you'll get to Kashkais, which is a center in and of itself, but the periphery all around, uh, let's say the municipality took from a very early age a much more callous approach to how they would plan the outside of the city and the periphery as they did uh, the, the center, and this is how the virtually exclusive residential suburb was born, okay? 
This is another massive plan. What is interesting, I'm, I'm gonna have to stand up because basically what they did here is in 1948, we started appearing, is you have two uh, main lines, okay? This is what I call uh, mafosa. It's like a kind of moat, you know? Like around the castle, you have a moat. With, and so already this, they had uh, two different moats, which is um, a train line going here, the little center, which is a huge part, which makes a kind of division. And so you have the first periphery here, and the second periphery there, and this is the center. Look how minute and closely planned the, the center is, as opposed to the periphery. And what we'll see happening very quickly is you have a vision which is, it's kind of like a perversion of what Le Corbusier wanted. So it's, it's very strict zoning, though, which isn't actually consistent. So it's strict zoning, but for the periphery. Because when you go to the center, you have cultural hubs, you have all kinds of things in strict proximity, but as you approach periphery, there are these huge swathes of places that were intended to be only residential. And this is why I put that W.W. W. Jacobs uh, uh, quote in the beginning, is to be very careful what you wish for, because you might just get it. And in the case of Lisbon, from the massacre in 1966 onward, this is what we got. So you have a huge, the purple, the purple area to the east, which became abandoned, uh, or largely abandoned, from the 80s, 90s onward, this was meant to be an industrial area. And this, by the way, this is one of my favorite municipal master plans that I've ever seen, because it is a caricature of what a city should be. If you look into the center, there, there's a commercial area, and everywhere else is just residential. So you have, um, you have these yellow zones, which are kind of, they're defined as cultural academic spaces, and everywhere else is just residential. It's just these swathes of, of, of houses, and for me, what I'm really, really, um, you know, looking back for me, the only tragedy is the extent to which the municipality actually managed to imprint this plan, this 1966 plan, into the territory. And this is bringing us uh, huge problems as we'll, as, we'll, as we'll see. So this is a strategic plan. Again, very, okay, this is, the, the, this is wonderful. This is the 1994 uh, municipal master plan. So, this is not a representation of what the city is. This is a representation of what they would have it be. Anyone who lives in Lisbon and knows, um, this diversity that's here uh, represented doesn't really come through. When you start going from this first periphery onwards, so this is again the train line that I spoke to you of, okay? This is the city plan, this is a, as soon as you get to here, this, uh, your kind of diversity that they're trying to represent doesn't come through. We have these huge swathes of residential areas, these huge parts, which um, most people don't want to go to. So for example, if you come to Lisbon and you, and you want to go to see a really nice park, you're going to go to these really small ones. So scale does matter, you know? But if you ask me, where do you go? I'm not going to tell you to go to these parts. I'm going to tell you to go to Estrela. I'm going to tell you to go to uh, Pris Pial. These really small, uh, kind of minutely planned, uh, tight-knit, um, different uh, uses that were, that were fortified into the center. This is how Lisbon stands <coughs> today. This is a real representation of what Lisbon is, okay? Very, very tightly packed uh, places of reference that people go to on a daily basis to meet for uh, their work, uh, especially if you're looking to have fun. You know, a lot of people, the whole of the city converges onto uh, the bike walls, for example, if you've all been to, if you've been to bike walls and actually from there a little bit, uh, the whole of the city converges from there. And then you have these uh, sometimes we call them uh, pejoratively these dormitories. And if I were to make a pick, this is just uh, central Lisbon. This, in a, on a metropolitan scale, spans out onto the southern uh, onto the southern bank, which is even worse, unfortunately. So they made an even uh, worse job of, uh, of promoting. Um, so they made an even worse, um, let's say, job of actually projecting to a city that is meant to be lived in as opposed to a kind of uh, character of a city uh, that, that, that can be uh, used in equitable moments. This is, um, I love this quote, I love this quote. Um, this is Adam Prisne, this is the one of the others we have uh, called uh, Jean Seiches. This is a very strange tendency for people in Lisbon to deal with everything to be called Joel. There's Jean Seiches, there's Jean Fran, there's Jean Cabral, there's too many, too many Jeans on If I actually say that I'm going to Jean as well, uh, hopefully I'll be one of the last, the last one coming in. We'll get some other uh, names coming in, but this is really nice. He's, he speaks of dead end cities with no end in sight. And this is a kind of attempt to uh, critique these endless, strong fields of residential areas which have grown up out of the city. But the reason why they're really important is because they only exist in relation to the center. 
right? So people live there. Not because they want to live there. They live there because they want to live as close as they can to the to the center. And this is um. It's like a family of one the same hair. So when someone lives there, not because they want to live there, but they live there insofar as they want to go to a certain place where they can work, to have fun, to interact with their friends. And what this does, and this is really where, where I want to get to, is we have, through the applications of utopian visions, we ended up building highly hierarchical cities. And the latest twist in the story is that the places that are now central, the main places of convergence, are quickly and not only becoming places that we converge on to have fun, like by walking to the drink or perhaps a movie somewhere, they're now becoming places of attraction for tourists. And so just as before you had the centerpiece of a representation of the sun as a big, as a big power, uh, Mecca, representation of unity, you have uh, representations of uh, whatever these now the centers of, the, of, of European cities in particular, Lisbon is specifically visible, it's an even stranger situation where it isn't even a central place that represents political power, it's something that emanates outward. It's places where people from abroad come in to try and witness how people live or how people used to live, but in doing so, are kicking people out through the process of gentrification. And so we're actually, we're, we're, this, kind of centerpiece of the city is becoming not only a caricature of itself, it's becoming a self-destructive vision of what urban life used to be in a kind of ironic twist. Anyway, I, 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 I yeah, I'm gonna lose myself there. So we have these monofunctional suburbs which sprawl out, and what this does is it creates a very, very strict social division. And so what I'm going to try and end is that I'm going to try and end on a note, which is that you know, utopian and utopian visions obviously have an effect on the city, but perhaps more and more, we not only need to be very careful as opposed to the actual results that our utopian visions of, of cities have, perhaps we need to reformulate them all together. And perhaps we need to see them as the inherently dangerous visions of what cities are supposed to be. I think we really need to listen to people, there's a, a wonderful uh, thinker called Zizek, and he often, he often explains that one of the best ways to oppress the working class is to take away their vision, take away the capacity to envision a, be a, better, a better future. And I think we not only need new visions, we need new cliches. So these utopian visions of radiocentric urban utopias were the cliches of yesterday. We need not to uh, strip our urban vision away from cliches. We need new cliches. We need new cliches that become as um, as common as these as these old, highly centralized utopian visions. And I think if we do manage to, as urbanists, to implement not only new visions but to really use whatever means we have necessary to imbue the common people with these kind of visions, then we might have a chance of being a positive force. Um, in the in the future. Again, I'm not even leaving you because I'm running out of time, but I just want to make sure. So I end with this note: you should be uh, very, very careful what you wish for because you may receive it. And that's really um, the main idea I have when I think of utopian visions. The real tragedy of urban utopias, in regards not to how we explain them, not not regarding these abstract visions of creating a utopia and egalitarian societies, but when it comes to the most tangible uh, pattern that we see in utopian visions, i.e. the territorial distribution, the worst thing that has happened has been not that we didn't get what we desired and what we wanted to, but the extent to which we actually made our so-called dreams come true and the extent to which they are very quickly turning in this, into a sort of urban uh, nightmare. Thank you. Thank you all. The three presentations were very interesting and different. And uh, uh, maybe I'll start by asking you if you have questions, so that I won't. We don't have so much time again, so we'll let you make the questions. Yeah, but it's not too much. Um, I have two questions: one from Claire and one from Rafael. So, uh, Claire is, um, do you think that artists involved in governments and companies and thinking about ecological change and kind of change desperately have an 
impact in, in the way we think about cities? Can artists really contribute to, to that? And, um, and how is your experience in, in raising awareness for the government, let's say? And for Raphael, um, thank you for starting with Thomas More. It is actually the question I wanted to ask at the previous panel, which was cut. Uh, for me, when I was uh, reading the book of Moore, it was, or this utopia was maybe not a social utopia for me, or was it a bit of psychoanalytical representation of you want to exclude people uh, that you don't like, and this also happens in cities because we're afraid of the evil in ourselves. The, the, we don't accept other people because we don't accept parts of ourselves, and I think maybe this is why people who live in diverse cities have more healthy, are a bit more, <laughs> I, I don't want to generalize, but they're used to seeing things they don't like, so they're more used to accepting parts of their own selves that they don't like, and then when you isolate everything formally that you don't like, you don't accept yourself, basically. Um, so, socially engaged art and um, participatory art is all the rage at the moment, and I think they really do think they can change the world. I don't, I don't think we can change the world. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I don't think we have those kinds of powers. Um, but, uh, uh, and, and I've, I used to be a participatory artist, but you'll notice uh, from that work that I just presented, I actually didn't work with community in the creation of it they just participated in the exhibition and that's actually what I've moved towards. Um, I, yeah, so I, we definitely can't change the world, but I think actually artists get away with being very provocative in a way that other disciplines don't. Um, and there's an expectation that we might be a little bit anarchist, we might be a little bit destructive, we might say things. Um, and so you can use that leverage to get things on the public record. Um, but I think it's really important that artists also learn to um, write and communicate what they're doing because um, it's not enough just to do it in the community and leave. And I, 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 that's why I put together this quite enormous document because, you know, it's not my home. Um, and I was entrusted with a lot of the information because I was living with those people, living beside them. Um, and so it, it, it's very important that there's some kind of lasting um, resonance after after that's over and you know i didn't have time to talk about it but the house is you know since being demolished and turned into medium density so that's the only reason i was given it it's part of it's part of what what is happening so um so yeah i don't think we can change the world but i think we can we get away with being more provocative than perhaps other disciplines um i think that disruption is a key word in that i mean uh if you see everything very tied up and, and you need to, to transform it into something, you need to disrupt it first, uh, create some critical thinking about it, and then you, maybe you can change it. I, I'm, not, I'm not so sure that uh, just by being in the diverse environment, you are more accepting, because what I see in Brazil is not that. We live in a much more diverse environment than you live here in Europe. And what we see right now is that we are getting more and more divided. And the places where this division is stronger, like when you compare Sao Paulo in Rio, uh, Rio things are much more, well, in a way, mixed. And in Sao Paulo they did a very good job separating poor people from rich people. And you see that people in Sao Paulo are much more reactionary than people in Rio overall, even though we are seems to be in a worse shape around right now. So I don't think that guarantees anything. I think uh, at some point you have to make people see things a bit different so you can make them uh, see other people for what they are. Uh, I think uh, it's fun. disruption is fundamental for us to get this, okay, uh, there, there are other ways of living than the one that I live in. Uh, let me just ask a small question. Uh, one, one that uh, uh, it, it puts for you, what, and it's really interesting that you say that you changed from working with, uh, with, with uh, people uh, that live in a, in a situated, uh, you are doing situated practice, but you stop working with the people that live there. I don't like to say communities because I don't know if there are communities or not. 
maybe a community is constructed during a project, I believe that, that's a better uh, conception of it. But you decided to, to work with a, like an archaeological, I don't know, yeah, way. It's that, that isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And uh, why did you change? Well, I do those kinds of works, and I'm, it's just a personal question. I'm really yeah. interested. And then I have another one for you. Um, I changed for a number of reasons. Okay. Firstly, I was really tired. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I think local government can quite regularly, municipal governments can quite regularly wheel you out as their social worker because you're much cheaper yeah. than actually solving the problem. Um, and I didn't really want to be a part of that. I also think that there, you're quite limited in the people that you engage with because you have short timelines and it's generally the community that's engaging in everything and you actually can't reach that diversity. Um, and so uh, another thing I now do is employ publicists um, on the back of that so that I make sure that I get like a lot of press because that is the only way. And we luckily, you know, Murdoch is our worst export. So Murdoch Press hates art. So if you do something like paint a house black, you'll get the front page of the newspaper for sure. And usually the, you then get people that love art coming along. <laughs> Um, and then um, finally, um, I, I think that ultimately the art outcome is often compromised and, um, and I think the public is incredibly smart and they know what good art is and they know what a good theatre experience is and so by doing it in that kind of archaeological methodology, which is my, my methodology for my whole PhD, I think I can produce very polished um, works that people love and have a legacy in those communities um, where there may have actually been a little bit more cynicism if they weren't as polished. Yeah, I, I agree with you. The, the, um, the, the thing is when, when the work has more, uh, you work with, uh, with, uh, with people that are mm, with participants, well, sometimes you, you get a risk of uh, being compromised there's a small chance, of a small uh, 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 hypothesis of opening, which is the embodied experience of those people, those persons, and that that's really interesting. But but I, I totally well. Yeah, I think it is, and I think that's why I still create immersive spaces. Yeah, because yeah, you, you still do that. You still yeah. so that was a twenty minute experience. Yeah. People were completely there was no view outside. It was complete sound design, so they were dislocated from. Um, yeah. what they knew of the yeah. world, yeah. yeah. And uh, I, I was uh, wondering when, uh, in the end of the semester, when you do uh, the experiments in public space, do people that live in the city also use spaces and they, they are close to that and they, what do they, do you have uh, any notion of how do they see your experiences? Well, uh, we've been doing that for eight years now, yeah. so it's kind of a thing in the city. Yeah. Uh, every every semester we have this. Every every semester is in a different space, and uh, but mostly uh, people from 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 the school itself, the students that have been through the process, go there and they make a big crowd there. And we have some people that pass by, and they're usually very puzzled by it. They think everything is very beautiful, but. Uh, I, I think uh, they don't really think about it uh, more than that it is a very beautiful thing. And they're usually hoping that this will actually change the space for um, in a more permanent way. Uh, we wish we could do that, but the thing is, uh, our main focus on that time is the students, it's not the city. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, I, I wish that some, at some point, maybe when you have all this critical mass built in the city, we'll be able to turn this into a, an extension project and then we can do these things that are a bit more permanent. We're hoping to get there, but we're not there, there yet. So it's just a, an aesthetic experience that they have for a very short period. And I think it gets them, th them thinking, but not to the point that I would like them to. <laughs> Thank you. Is there any more questions? Maybe just one very small uh, well, question uh, for clarification. Joanne, uh, you titled your presentation, um, I think something with electrical, right? Was, uh, wasn't it electrical? Yeah. Um, uh, 
tried to spare you um, as much as I could during the presentation. Uh, the more like um, like philosophical underlines, of, like I concentrate on the shape of utopian visions. Uh, there's a book by a, now made famous by a series of movies called Blade Runner, called "Do Androids uh, Dream of Electric Sheep?" Okay, and it was a science fiction novel that was basically an attempt to try and see whether this was like before we actually had AI. Okay, this guy was a genius called Phil Philip K. Dick, and it was made into a Blade Runner. Okay, and the whole point of Blade Runner, Philip K. Dick's um, books, were to basically try and see first and foremost. If robots develop to a point where they reach consciousness, will they have parallel to us? Will, will they be parallel to us? Okay, and it ends up being a kind of way to try and ask them, ask the question. Okay, but regardless of whether robots can ever reach a true state of consciousness or humanity, what what's really important in that question is that it gets us to reflect on what being a human being is is in the first place. Okay, so in the actual paper, what I go into is how these utopian visions relate to um, first of all. How do urbanists relate to citizens? Okay, but most importantly, not so much trying to answer that question, but seeing how that question reveals what being an urbanist is in the first place. Do you know what I mean? And so it was a kind of tongue-in-cheek reference to these kind of um, to these questions, which actually get us to um, reflect on the initial object of, of of our study. And so, really, what I go into in the actual paper is what the simp what the actual fact that um, these utopian visions are applied so consistently by urbanists, what, the, what that tells us about, about urbanists, but about the actual profession, okay? Do you know what I mean? So just like Philip K. Dick in his book goes into, okay, therefore, what does it mean to be a human being? Okay, I ask the question, so therefore, seen as these radically hierarchical, uh, strict visions, even authoritarian visions, have been so uh, ubiquitous in urban planning, okay? What does it mean to be urban planning, uh, urban planning in the first place? And I obviously implicitly propose, okay, that in order for an urbanist to be an urbanist in full flow, we need to try and move into a situation where urban planning becomes a little bit more equitative, okay? And so what I'm, what I'm trying to essentially demonstrate, I mean, it was, it was left quite clear in the way that I made the presentation. I, I mean, I think eventually along the way that I'm trying to um, propose that in order for an urban planner to do his or her job in a legitimate fashion, okay, we need to move past these technocratic, rational, comprehensive planning uh, visions of not only of what cities should be, but how uh, we actually get there. You know, for example, a lot of people talk about um, participatory planning. That's not enough. We need to talk about participatory planning and participatory management, okay? Do you know what I mean? So it was is an attempt to use these kind of images of the utopian city with the center just kind of radiates out, out into you, okay? What I'm essentially trying to say is that if we want to live in a democratic society, to what extent do we not actually democratize key areas of our, and one of, it's urban planning, of course. In, a, in an age where um, we are becoming urban species, we will never have anything so much close as to a democratic society or an equitable society if we don't target very specific areas of our society. Finance could be one of them. Urban planning is definitely one of them as well. So regards to the title, it's a tongue-in-cheek, it's a tongue-in-cheek reference to that I go into in the paper to Philip K. Dick. Sorry, I made that really long. Any other questions? Thanks very much for your presentation, Sir Yvonne. Um, I presume some of you saw that last night Lisbon is awarded the new Green Capital of Europe 2020. So the question is, what does that mean for Lisbon? What is a green city? Uh, to Joanna, be interested very much going from, from form to process, so to actually be start engaging in truly democratic processes, engaging all at a scalar, scalar from the very local to more up to the macro, which I think is what municipalism is answering. Then also come back to Melbourne, which is where the 2017 Eco Cities Conference uh, was on. So to, to Claire, you know, I'm wondering what was the impact of that dialogue? Did you was there discussions about what you were doing? Because uh, there was all these people talking about utopias and how we get there, blah blah blah. Uh, I think in a bit of a closed ghetto, <laughs> albeit. But uh, in terms of when you say we can't change the world, I'd counter that because I'd say. That, like if we just leave it go, it's the end of humanity. We're dead. Our species. The rest will carry on. Lives. 
So therefore, I think that's the need that we have to. We don't have a choice. So I think that the art is part of that, how, what we're doing. Um, yeah, sorry, I just meant single-handedly. <laughs> Artists working to change the world. <laughs> um, but actually, the conversations I had around planning with that local community outside the kind of really um, uh, often angry setting that um, planning finds themselves in were really positive. But I, I thought people were really generous about understanding that cities are um, rapidly changing things and um, that you don't necessarily permanently get to hold your turf and your aesthetic and your idea of what a good city is. And look, this might come because Melbourne is incredibly multicultural, I don't know. Um, not, there's not tensions with that, of course, but um, perhaps we are very used to difference and we're very used to rapid change because that's our, our history. Um, but then finally, I kind of just also think that Australians respond to dystopians. If I, dystopias. If I'd done a utopian vision, like I don't think anyone would have gone or been interested. <laughs> Um, I think we're hugely cynical about utopias because we're a colony and most of the people that have immigrated since then were either chucked there by the British because they didn't want them or uh, fled utopian visions across Europe and Asia um, where their families were killed. Thank you all. I think uh, we have to finish, but maybe we can continue to talk at lunch in a more informal way. So thank you everybody, it was really nice.